So I am pleased to be here with all of you to witness the beginning of great things for our state. And we have a panel representing investors who are with us today to share how they see opportunity zones and opportunity funds working in your community. Mark Bell is the Chief Executive Officer of Harbor Bay Real Estate Advisors, a real estate development firm that strives to build better communities through well-developed, well-positioned, and well-managed properties. Mr. Bell, please join us up here. Michael Taylor is the Senior Vice President and West Territory Executive for PNC Bank. As part of that role, he is responsible for community economic development activities in Ohio and seven other states. Previously, he was the President and Executive Director of the National City Community Development Corporation, which invested more than $1.5 billion to revitalize neighborhoods. Mr. Taylor. Jonathan Tower is the founder and managing partner of Arcteris, an impact investment firm that manages the Arcteris Principal Protected Opportunity Zone Fund and four predecessor funds. He invests in growth-oriented businesses and infrastructure with an emphasis on underserved and underrepresented communities, which is all about opportunity zones, by the way. So please welcome our distinguished panel. We, uh, we have three experts here that are sharing their time with us, and I will ask them some, some questions, starting with Mr. Bell. Um, you are bringing Illinois money to Ohio. How about that? Illinois money to Ohio uh, for a project that you're, that you're working on with both state officials and local officials. And as we saw in the video, How's it going, working that project in Ohio? And more importantly, what have you learned from this experience? And what would you like these folks to know about that experience? Sure, thank you, Pat. Um, we've had a great experience thus far. Um, you know, we're very encouraged about the Opportunity Zone Fund um, and zones. It works well with our firm. Uh, because we are generally long-term holders. Uh, so uh, looking at something with a 10-year hold, I think um, it, does, it does a lot as a developer. You think very strategically how you build and you manage um, something that will stand the test of time. As it relates to the development itself, um, we've been, as Pat mentioned, working with both local and state officials. The process, so I think probably is very important uh, for this room is I think developers, truthfully, we have a lot of um, choices on where we develop. Um, and we'll get into, I think, a lot of details on, on the specifics of opportunity zones. But I would say as a developer, aside from opportunity zones, and maybe what's, again, very pertinent to this room, is how easy is a municipality to do business with? You know, how does it work from, I think, the director as a former mayor, uh, to city council, to the planning commission, down to the economic development uh, head, how those different groups collaborate and how that is communicated to the developer is really the difference between, in my opinion, why a developer chooses to invest in that town or not. That's great. Great point. Uh, Mr. Taylor, you have worked on numerous projects out of state, outside of Ohio, particularly using new market tax credit, which we used in uh, the creation of the opportunity zones to kind of mimic the, uh, the new market structure. How, how do you see the two programs working together? Uh, and, and maybe even expand it, um, though you are an expert in new market tax credit, not just that tax credit, but also other tax credits, historic tax credits, uh, if you're in a an old building, uh, for instance, in a rural or an urban area, or maybe even a low-income housing tax credit if it's a housing project. And what other programs should be considered in the funding mix for folks who are interested in this, in your opinion? Oh, thank, thank you, Pat. Uh, and, and, and PNC has a strong history of utilizing a variety of tools to stimulate economic development and revitalize uh, uh, communities. And as you made reference with the new market uh, tax credits, we've been very active in new market tax credits 
throughout, you know, our, our particular market area, enterprise Y, and that, uh, and here in the state of Ohio, we've been very uh, successful in putting a new market tax credit equity in play in various types of projects. Have about 425 million, you know, of total project costs, which which is associated with maybe 150 uh, million of direct equity using the new market tax credits. And, and yet you think about it as well is that uh, when you think of the new park tax credit legislation probably was in 2000 or so and it took about to 2003 to really get that program going and so i'm excited about the opportunity zone recognizing that we've created our opportunity zone fund pretty much just right out of the chute and i think that the benefit that we had is as a company we had traditionally provided equity investments uh, in real estate types of projects. And so this kind of gone just with our strategy, you know, of using these various uh, types of tools. Now, there are some similarities of Opportunity Zone uh, Capital as well as uh, New Market. Both of them provide a high level of equity. Uh, when you think of the New Markets, uh, you're getting maybe about 25% of equity in a project. Uh, and in our model uh, with the Opportunity Zone, we're getting about 70% of the fair market value of equity uh, in a project. Now, certainly after a 10-year period, there's an event that has to occur uh, that uh, the new markets of a seven-year that you have an unwind and the same for the Opportunity Zone uh, where we will have a refinance. So lots of, lots of consistency in, in many ways, uh, once again, but it's really just how do you get equity in a project and how do you kind of create the capital stack? When you ask about what other types of, of, of funding sources, uh, we see uh, a variety of funding sources. Uh, the Opportunity Zone Fund typically is not the full level of, of capital. We see capitals coming in, CDBG, HUD 108. Uh, we did a project, since we have closed on four projects up to this point, uh, we have had one that we are with a historic tax credit. Uh, the new markets can work very effectively through uh, the structure, uh, but at this particular time, we've decided to, in a complicated kind of an environment, to try to keep it as simple as possible. And so we've kind of like just kind of stripped them down the line and just used them in cooperation. And if I could just make one further comment, because it, um, it not only is it the sources of funds, but it's the types of programs that could actually be available in a particular area. I think of uh, in Cuyahoga County in the city of Cleveland, uh, where you have the Opportunity Corridor, where the Ohio is a strong uh, supporter of that infrastructure economic development uh, project, and you have the mayor's transformation uh, 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 project program, uh, and then you layer that with the Opportunity Zone, you're actually now leveraging various programs that could bring various types of resources to make the project work. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Tower, you are actually working on an impact fund. Tell us what that means. And if you had a message to the audience of what type of impact, pun intended, uh, what type of impact you would need to see from a local community to get your attention to invest in a neighborhood or an opportunity zone within their community? Um, so I co-founded a firm called Arcteris based in Boston about 10 years ago. It's a, an impact investment fund. And truth be told, when we started it, we didn't know the term impact investing. It just wasn't part of the nomenclature. But we said that we wanted to invest in companies located in distressed communities, low-income communities, both urban and rural, where the end game goal is providing pathways to prosperity and living wage jobs. My partners and I came out of pretty traditional backgrounds in venture capital and private equity, and our old goal was to create unicorn IPO companies that would bring our investors lots of success. And we, we did well at that, and we decided to do a shift where the goal is really something more tangible in the community where we could work with local political leaders and foundations and create these goals. So fast forward, 
we just launched our fourth fund in 2018. Uh, all of them kind of look like opportunity zone funds, even though they predated the real OZ legislation. Uh, we invest typically in manufacturing companies that have the ability to create 50, 100, 200 jobs in an area. We do a lot in worker training, making sure that people have the skills they need to be able to climb a, a ladder in a manufacturing company. And then we do a lot of training at the CEO level too, giving them the kind of equivalent of a two-year executive business program in partnership with the Initiative for Competitive Inner City. All of these funds have had a public-private partnership model. Uh, we did two nationwide funds investing in companies around the country, and then uh, U.S. Treasury for Fund 3 asked us to do a pure Michigan fund, where they put up 20% principal protection that matched the 80% that we, our investors, including PNC Bank, uh, put in. Thank you to PNC. And so we created a uh, large single state fund out of that. It attracted um, investment capital from people who maybe weren't looking for impact. It, because of the principal protection, it unlocked the wallet share of numerous investors that you know, didn't wake up that morning saying, let's go invest in Detroit and Flint and Pontiac and places like that. This was 2013, 2014. We were still in the middle of an automotive fallout and the you know, kind of tail end of the 20, uh, 2008, 2009 recession. There, there, there was a lot of uncertainty in that market, but um, it worked and it attracted a lot of attention from other states too, who said, hey, can we replicate that Michigan model in all our state, in, in other states? And so for Fund 4, we went back to Nationwide. We said, we'll partner with state governments and we will commit 25 to $50 million per state, in some cases per city, of economic development capital to grow companies that will be significant base job creators. And we don't do this as you know, the team from Boston figuring out what Cleveland needs or what Detroit needs. We work holistically with local business leaders and local government leaders. So we launched that fund and um, I was involved in a lot of conversations about opportunity zones and thinking in the back of our mind that this thing is never going to pass Congress. It didn't look like it was going to Tell get, me about it. it. Yeah, it was, it was tough, and it was, it was a Hail Mary pass at the tail end, and thank, thank goodness uh, uh, there was good support here. And um, so it, it got through, and a couple of weeks later, wound up joining the Technical Corrections Working Group, which uh, finally concluded 95% you know, of its work last week with the clarifications that went out explaining how these funds will really act and what the tax consequences will be and what types of investments will work. In the process of that, we um, entered into a competitive process with the Kresge Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation, which wanted to make sure that some of these Opportunity Zone funds had a mission impact. We do deeply care about creating jobs. We uh, are concerned about some of the unintended side effects of Opportunity Zone development. So we partnered with these foundations. Uh, they got 151 applications from Lisk and Morgan Stanley and a lot of other big groups. We wound up prevailing with this program where the foundations are providing principal protection, just like the federal government used to do. And last week, Finance Authority of Maine, which is uh, the Maine Economic Development Agency of Maine, they just approved another $10 million guarantee for investments that we make in Maine. We're working actively with um, different foundations and agencies within Ohio to explore the opportunity of doing something here. So ultimately, we will be making, again, in the Opportunity Zone Fund, 25 to $50 million place-based commitments where there is a principal protection partner, whether it's a foundation or a government agency or CDFI, CDE, acronyms galore, and uh, we will be deploying this capital. So uh, impact for us is really around base job creation and offering social mobility. You might be earning a minimum wage now, but what can we do to equip you so that a year from now or two years from now, you have the skills and resources to deserve 15 or 20 or $30 an hour? We really want to give people the skills that they need to um, improve themselves you probably missed the briefing uh, when you said pure Michigan. You can't say pure Michigan here. <laughs> you probably just sent the mayor into cardiac arrest. I'm uh, not from Michigan. <laughs> 
So if you look around the wall, you can see communities here from rural areas, from uh, we've got community leaders from Ohio's biggest cities. So we've got a, a real mix here. And when we introduced the legislation, Ron Kine, a, a, a rural Democrat from Wisconsin, and I had a study done by the EIG group. And, and Ohio, coincidentally, had an equal number of urban and poor census tracts. Uh, which is am amazing, kind of reflective of the nation. And we were intentional about limiting the number of those to drive investment and, and, and work with governors to do that in every state with the advice and, and support and counsel of local government officials. We have many of them here today. So to drill down into one piece of advice that you all would have, and we'll start with Mr. Bell, if you had to give one piece of advice to allow them to set their community apart or their specific or specific opportunity zones apart from all those in the 49 other states and quite frankly our state as well. What's the one thing as an investor you're looking at or you can tell them do this to set yourself apart? Sure, great question. I'd say don't make the moment bigger than it needs to be. Um, specifically, and I'm a football guy, it, it's just basic blocking and tackling. I think sometimes cities get wrapped up into complexities that they don't need to get wrapped up into. Believe it or not, um, you know, courteous thank yous and follow-ups and processes, these are things that, again, I believe make a difference between a developer investing in a community or not investing in a community. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. It's kind of funny, but uh, we were at a conference in Las Vegas um, a couple years ago, and I had the opportunity uh, to meet um, the mayor, all of the city council, the city attorney of Salina, Texas, outside of Dallas. And our team was a little bit confused because a lot of the communities you work in, you're not even allowed to have that many people at council together off-site because of some legal reason. Nevertheless, we're in Las Vegas and they are really promoting energetically Salina, Texas. Now, I was really baffled about this and um, they brought census tracts and they brought surveys and they brought literature and different things and and we're having cocktails and, and whatnot and did harbor bay invest in salina texas no we did not however we flew down to salina texas six months after that conference into dallas it's north of frisco and we sat down and we really appreciated their energy so what i mean by don't make the moment bigger than it needs to be it's basic blocking and tackling it's how do you relate to the private sector. We talk about public-private partnership, it's trying to make the processes as easy as possible because I gotta be honest, investment and development is as hard as it gets. So when we talk about recourse, or we talk about all the pitfalls that happen in a development project and the entitlements, how form-based zoning, if we can stick to form-based zoning and have a clear pathway as, as to how I get through planning commission and city council without 50 different setbacks and wasting money on design engineering when we're getting told one thing but really council wants another thing, these things matter immensely. Hopefully that answers your question. Very, very good. Mr. Taylor, can you add to that from your years of yeah, I, I can't, I can't, I can't agree more. And and, and added to that is uh, rely on your trusted advisors. Uh, pick up the phone. Uh, give give a call. Set up a meeting. You know, sit around the table and kind of work through these particular opportunities. But once again, that's right. Uh, kind of uh, keep it keep it simple. You know, when I think of um, how we invest uh, in particular projects, and when there's a particular opportunity. Uh, you will determine if you need debt or if there's a gap and there's a, a need for some additional equity and what have you. Uh, we don't often, you know, ask uh, what the source of the capital. 
when a bank shows up at the table or an investor shows up at the table, it's kind of rare that you ask for the, the source. And, uh, and so the, the complexity of the opportunity zone and how we're using our capital gains and what have you, it should not actually, in my perspective, be as transparent. It's really about you know, the project. It's really about how do you create the project that would be sustaining and have the appropriate mix, with the financing mix. And so that does require a, a level of understanding and so rely on that particular you know, expertise to sit around the table and help you kind of put the project you know, to, to, together. Uh, once again, that is, that is, in my mind, that is the, the, the key uh, for, once again, uh, how do you create something uh, that, once again, that, that uh, you can get some momentum from, because I think momentum is very important, uh, and that, once again, that is sustaining. And just to add to that, uh, and Mr. Bell mentioned this earlier, that 10-year hold. So while nothing is ever certain, if you're a community and you get an investor, he's going to try or she's going to try to stay there for over 10 years, which is a huge asset to that area that hasn't historically had that private investment, and private investment creates other private investment as well. Anything to add to that from your expertise? I think I'd say, it, first off, I mean, I, I agree 100% with Mark and Michael's uh, suggestions there, and I, I think that that is the primary answer. The, the secondary answer, tying it into to Pat's comments, is you know, once you have that active capital, take an active role in seeing where it's going to go. And I, I'm not saying turn into Boulder, Colorado and say we're not going to give any permits to anyone who wants to do anything in an opportunity zone. That's not the right approach either. And that, that's just a stopgap measure. I'm, I'm saying um, you know, the needs of Maine are very different from the needs of Baltimore. And those needs are very different from South Chicago and Stockton, California and rural Utah. And these are all the different kinds of places where we're focused. Um, in Flint, they are not worried about urban gentrification at all. It's welcome. Um, in downtown Detroit, could be different. But um, I'd say take an active role. Whether you're a foundation or a mayor or city council, you, know, you have the ability to say, hey, advanced manufacturing is the thing for our future. We really want to emphasize this. Or there's an extreme shortage of workforce housing in our community. We really want to encourage these types of projects. If you're able to streamline zoning, if you're able to pull together the foundation community or allocatees of new markets tax credits to support a project, it's going to steer those capital flows into things that'll benefit your community. Great point. I think we might be out of time. We, do we have a we have more time here? We do have more time. Any other comments? Uh, I'm going to ask a question that uh, I'll just let any of you answer. And then, Michael, I think you have a, a comment. Uh, you know, one of the criticisms has been, well, there are opportunity zones that have areas that are already being gentrified or are seeing private investment. Uh, why did you allow for that to happen? Uh, and as, as you guys know, some of those, those uh, uh, opportunity zones have pretty diverse census tracts, and there might be a small piece of a census tract. Just like in New Markets, there was an article, uh, NPR piece, uh, several years ago when we were working on this, uh, on New Markets, where a piece of a, a census tract was being redeveloped in Chicago and had a very nice hotel on it, but the rest of that census tract was pretty poor. Um, what do you say to a community that might face that and be concerned about that? Uh, charge ahead forward. Uh, what lessons, Michael, in particular, from your work on new markets would you advise? Yeah. Um, it, it would, and, and when you think about our fund, and we're going back to even Jonathan's comments about impact, uh, that's what we look for first. Uh, and that we have structured our fund to comply with the Community Reinvestment Act. And so, it, and that's, and the reason why we're doing that as well is because we're passing on some pretty good benefits. We, uh, they're very favorable terms and conditions. Uh, we are offering a below market preferred return, somewhere between three to five percent. 
Uh, generally, when you are an equity investor and after that 10 year period of time, uh, if that asset has appreciated, generally that investor would get some of the upside and our model uh, does not require us to get uh, you know, any of the upside. And so we're passing that on to, once again to the developer to once again to try to make it work. Uh, and that to actually then to have the impacts that we're looking for. And I talked about sustainability, but also momentum. It's really, it's important to make sure that, we, that you get the momentum and, and timing is quite important in creating uh, you know, that momentum. Uh, so by putting it into the framework of the Community Reinvestment Act, it kind of keeps you more narrow and focused and really having more concentration in a particular area that would spur economic development, that would create affordable housing, uh, that would provide the, you know, some services, some much needed services to that particular community. Uh, so we're very mindful not to get too far outside of that lens because we feel as though that's really what is needed in these particular markets. Uh, something that's more socially impact uh, uh, focused. I think uh, CRA is a, a great lens to look at some of these things through. Um, yeah, there's principally nothing wrong with using a opportunity zones to create a mobile mini storage park in Tucson, Arizona. It's never going to qualify for CRA unless you're creating hundreds of jobs, which those don't. But within the four corners of the act, that's permitted activity. And I think if an investor sees a, an attractive ROI and that fits with their strategy, they should go do it. It's just, it's not a CRA investment, and you know, we're also a CRA fund, so we, we look for community development and community impact. Um, you know, the analogy here is the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, companies go public all the time. Some of them are good and some of them are bad. The New York Stock Exchange doesn't really judge. It's an open free market. I think for community leaders, your goal here is really to attract the types of development and the types of companies and builders of those companies that will leave some sort of positive, sustainable imprint on your community. Um, let's not just build a movie set that, you know, you build it up and it's gone in six months and someone leaves town. The point is 10 years from now to be able to look back and say, this was the best social experiment done in 50 years and suddenly, you know, the, the time was right, you know, we struck it, we were able to attract a lot of opportunity zone capital to our town or our state, and we had a transformative benefit to show for it. Things are better now. And if this social experiment is successful, 10 years from now, it doesn't need to be repeated. It, you know, just Jobs Act did a good job of solving the credit crisis. There's not such an imbalance in credit today that the Jobs Act programs needed to be renewed. They were legislated, they did their job, and no need for refer renewal. So SSBCI was not reauthorized in 2018. That makes sense. But the problem today is the disparity between the recovery of some areas and the recovery of other areas and influences that are not free markets that have disrupted that recovery. So here's the best chance that I know of to kind of level that playing field once and for all. Yeah, I, I would agree with, with the comments. Um, I, I would say that uh, we look at, at the social impact of an opportunity zone. Uh, we, we frankly trust the legislatures, uh, legislators uh, that they, they, they put some great means and methods together that over a long duration, uh, as you guys were saying, uh, I think you'll see some great social impact. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that, you know, to, to us as a developer, the opportunity zone is kind of the, maybe the, the fifth layer of the cake, or maybe it's the icing. Now, every cake has icing, right? So it is important, but I would encourage you guys to really build your base. You need to understand that you have to have the, the policies and the procedures in order to first and foremost attract the idea of development. And then if it's an opportunity zone, then we are talking about different sources and funds and different things that enhance the project. But if you don't have the base figured out, it's never going to happen. So I, I would really encourage everyone uh, to really look at the, at, the, at the policies you have to make it as easy as possible and then to get 
energetic about it. You have to go out and showcase if you have talent, if you have opportunities, you can't sit and be reactive. You have to be proactive. And, and, and like that, the, the base that he was talking about when we saw the video, you know, in Ohio City and the relationships, you know, with the stakeholders and the nonprofit that have been driving activity in that market for some time. And it was pretty interesting even looking at some of the video of seeing, you know, some of our earlier investments uh, with some of the historic structures and some housing that's actually occurred. And so uh, you're right, it requires you creating a base and creating a, a infrastructure that you can actually use as that platform for other kinds of opportunities because we're talking really about, you know, utilizing the various tools to revitalize communities. That's, that's the key. That's, that's a great point to kind of close on for at least the, the time being, but as the original author of this, uh, going back to a string of things that you guys said, this isn't the be-all, end-all in and of itself. It's a tool. Uh, clearly, we haven't moved the needle in, in some communities. The recovery of, from the Great Recession uh, was impactful in some parts of America. Many parts of America have been left behind. Many communities have left behind. And some of those communities have never been able to bust out of whatever problem they had, whether it was losing a plant 50 years ago or just not being able to develop. And despite the fact that we have spent a lot of money at the federal level, money at the state level, money at the local level to try to incentivize development, and sometimes a lot of public development, private development in some of these areas has not come. And so if this can incentivize that with those other things that you all talked about, then we will do something we haven't done before with a federal program that doesn't create any new federal bureaucracy and empowers people ultimately in this room in the end to work with investors to actually try to get a long-term investment in their community. So a good way to put a bow on it, for now at least.